everyone. It's really great to uh, be part of this symposium. I'm going to be presenting work on our uh, CIRM-funded CLIN-1 project, uh, where we're using a stem cell-based therapy for Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease is a CAG repeat expansion disease. And what that means is that within the gene called Huntington is a repeating CAG unit shown here. And in the disease itself, we all carry that repeat, but in the disease itself, that is expanded beyond a certain threshold that when translated into the protein then is expanded and creates an abnormally long stretch of glutamines in the protein. And there's a range of these repeats that occur in human disease. So for instance, when you have very long repeats up towards 100, above 60, that would result in younger onset Huntington's disease. And typical HD is somewhere in the 40 to 60 repeat range, which would translate into adult onset. Typically individuals are affected between the ages of 35 and 50. Uh, when they're in the prime of life, they have ch young children typically are in the midst of their careers. And at this point in time, there's really, there's no FDA approved treatments that change the course of the disease. So there's a very significant unmet medical need for Huntington's disease uh, treatments. And the disease itself is characterized by this very progressive impairment in the ability to control movement. Typically this is chorea or dance-like movements, which I'll show you in a minute. And there's a decline in cognition, um, being able to multitask, carry out daily tasks, carry out your job and psychiatric well-being. In the brain itself, it's characterized by uh, neuronal dysfunction. So the cells in the brain, the neurons in the brain, become less and less able to function appropriately. There's loss of medium spiny neurons in the striatum and, and atrophy of the cortex. And very notably, there is, and this is of relevance for later on in the talk, there's a lack of connectivity between the cortex and the striatum. The individuals lose those connections within the brain that, that allow appropriate function. It's caused by a single mutation, but it's a very complex disease. So in the brain itself, there's widespread effects. Uh, there's loss of structure within the striatum, as I mentioned, particularly the medium spiny neurons. And there's overall atrophy or shrinking of the cortex, but other brain areas are also affected. This is just a slice from a um, postmortem sample of brain from an affected individual and one from someone who died of HD. And what our goal then is, is to really find treatments that we can start in this early period before onset of symptoms. And the symptoms come on gradually, as I mentioned, but progressively with uh, the, the movement disorder, cognitive impairment, uh, and psychiatric dysfunction. And really, there's a very early loss of functional abilities that typically precedes the overt symptoms that you see with Huntington's disease. So we'd really like to get in and treat as early as possible. And multiple cellular processes are affected in Huntington's. This is just a video taken in Venezuela where there's a very large population of Huntington's patients. And you can see this very characteristic movement disorder, general wasting that occurs in disease. And this is a progressive ending in death typically between 15 and 20 years after diagnosed onset. And this is very end stage um, disease shown here where again, there's this profound wasting that goes on in the disease. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the investigators that are all part of this project. It really does take a village to do this kind of work. It's difficult work as everyone knows in this meeting. And uh, we have a large team at UCI. Uh, it's led by Jack Reedling in my group here at UCI. Um, Yuna Maison is a project manager that assists with everything in the project as well. And a number of individuals in the lab who work on the mouse studies and molecular studies. Neil Hermanowitz was our clinician here, uh, now Anna Morinkova. Edmund Nuki, neuropathologist. Jefferson Chen is a surgeon who will be doing the clinical trials. And we, this is part of a larger collaboration with UCLA, Michael Levine and Marie-Francois Chesselet, Charles Meschel at OHSU, and then uh, the team at UC Davis, Gerhard Bauer and Brian Fury, who have generated the GMP uh, cells. 
Um, Vicki Wheelock has been helping us quite a bit and our program officer, Lisa Kadick. A number of clinical and basic science advisors to help us through this. The GLP studies done at Charles River, uh, and we have a number of collaborations in the community through HDSA, HD Care, and of course, this project is funded by CIRM. So, what we're using is uh, are these ESI 017 derived neural stem cells, and these are from a was from BioTime now from Ajax. And we're taking these multipotent neural stem cells that can differentiate into either glia or neuronal precursors and uh, glia or neurons, and have established a robust differentiation protocol through with Gerhard and Brian at UC Davis. That involves a rosette formation and manual dissection step followed by expansion of the NSCs. And we've now developed a protocol for the clinical application with these cells with culturing for a period of time, harvesting, bringing into formulation media, and then shipping to the clinical site, and uh, have established parameters with flow, qPCR, Nestin as a anchor for flow, and karyotype sterility stability. And we're developing a panel based on single cell RNA-seq that we can use as we move forward. So the experimental design that we've used over the years to test efficacy and mechanisms, the general processes that occur following transplantation is to transplant these GMP grade human neural stem cells, the ESI-017 derived, into directly into the striatum of mice. And these are HD model mice, which I'll get into in a minute. We implant 100,000 per hemisphere test behavior and then collect tissue in the short-lived mice. This is after about four to five weeks and then we analyze the tissue for cell survival, differentiation, and molecular markers of HD. Typically what we see when we implant these is this sort of clump of cells. They don't tend to disperse widely, and this seems to be a characteristic of using the ES-derived cell NSCs in mouse tissue. The initial trials were done in the R62 model, and this is a mouse model, one of the first mouse models for Huntington's disease that expresses just a fragment of the um, Huntington gene and Huntington protein, but it is a piece that's very highly toxic and contains this expanded repeat. So we treat mice at a, between five and six weeks with the um, surgical implantation and let that go until they're a 10 weeks old, at which time they're sacrificed. During that period, they undergo a number of different behavioral tests. This includes rotor rod, running wheel, pull test, grip strength, and some memory and cognition. And we find significant behavioral improvement in many of these outcome measures, as well as improved electrophysiological impairments. And this was published uh, in stem cell reports. We also see that these cells survive in vivo and they differentiate. And during this short time period where we only have them in the mice for about four to five weeks, we tend to see them uh, differentiate into double cortin positive cells. So immature uh, neuronal populations. We see some uh, co-localization with beta-3 tubulin and MAP2. You can see with co-localization, the light blue uh, with the human cytosolic marker but we don't see mature neurons. So we do not see overlap with new N, for instance. So again, during that time frame, they tend to uh, differentiate into immature neurons and primarily into neuronal populations. We really don't see much in the way of glia, for instance. We also see that there's an effect on mutant Huntington accumulation in the mouse. So this is showing, this is a Western blot, just showing accumulation of protein in the HD brain and when we have, uh, this is, shows it in the mice, and when we treat with NSCs, we see a significant reduction in this. And this is, we believe, a, a very toxic form of Huntington that is found in the brain. We also see reduction in inclusions. We also find that there's a benefit potentially through the expression of BDNF, which is a trophic factor in the brain. And what we find is expression from the NSCs of BDNF when they differentiate in vivo. And this is with vehicle and with the NSCs. And believe that this is potentially compensating for the impaired cortical striatal connections that I mentioned previously uh, in the brains of these mice. 
We then went on and tested this in a long-term mouse model that lives for up to two years and had these implanted for eight months. Again, all the behavioral assays. So this is a full-length mouse model that has a longer-term pathogenesis. And we find very significant behavioral improvement, for instance, in this running wheel test, where you can see the vehicle down here where they're not able to perform, and the NSC treated are up here with the wild types. They also express neuronal markers after eight months in vivo. So this just shows that there's co-localization with new N uh, in these cells. So they've differentiated two mature neurons. And some of these even differentiate into medium spiny neurons, the, the cells that are most profoundly affected in the disease. And this is just co-staining with uh, DARP32 and CTIP2, which are markers for MSNs and with mature neuronal markers. What's really exciting as well is that they seem to potentially form connect synaptic connections with the host. So this would be, for instance, a synapse with a connection to a mouse cell and also human to human connections. And they, they appear to even this one appears to be coming from the cortex. So it's making connections with the endogenous host. And you can see this again here where these are the mouse cells that do not stain for the, the human marker forming connections with these NSCs and with the NSCs here. They also seem to be able to display mature neuronal properties at the level of neuroelectrophysiology, and I'm not going to be going into any of this in any detail, but you can see that there's um, sodium currents that are reflective of mature cells. Uh, these are some of the immature, for instance here, immature neurons that are transplanted. These are endogenous neurons, and with uh, some of these larger mature NSCs we find, human NSCs, you start to see some of the synaptic properties or electrophysiological properties of mature neurons, which was extremely exciting. We also see some rescue of membrane and synaptic properties of the host MSNs. So for instance, shown here is effects on uh, membrane properties. Just show one example where here's uh, the input resistance wild type with uh, just vehicle alone, and then with the transplanted cells, it goes back to the wild type levels. So where we're at now is uh, performing IND enabling activities and preclinical safety evaluation. So we're looking at long-term safety and tumor genicity with the mice, and this is in progress at Charles River. Spiking studies, again, in progress. We've just completed a uh, delivery and placement study of the NSCs in non-human primates with UC Davis, and I'll show a little bit from that. Uh, and then our goal is to file an IND and perform clinical startup activities. So just to show very, very quickly, we had uh, three non-human primate brains implanted with human NSCs for a month. They did not show any abnormalities during gross pathological examination. And the cells survived, and some even differentiated into immature neurons, again shown with this double cortin staining. And uh, some, again, they, some of them differentiated into immature neurons, where you can see this more clearly here with the human KU80 marker and double cortin. So where we are now also is we've um, worked with an international consortium to facilitate stem cell-based therapies for HD that's called Stem Cells for HD. This was a meeting we had in 2018 at UCI. And really this is to help the community to facilitate preclinical assessments, what we need to have in place, the clinical challenges, including immunosuppression, trial design, the stage of the HD patient, and so this has really uh, been helpful for the community. It's, it's um, in progress. And a lot of the patients that we'll be, uh, we'll be testing initially will come from Enroll HD, which is a longitudinal study of Huntington's patients all over the world and really is an incredible resource for these kinds of trials. So thank you very much for your attention and um, look forward to questions in the discussion. <music>